Welcome to the second free intro lecture. This one is called TMJ Issues in Orthodontics. Um, this presentation is the short and sweet version of a four-hour lecture. Uh, I typically, when I present this, this lecture, it's a 40-case lecture. I cut that down to make it short and sweet. Um, we're going to present a little bit of intro in seven cases. It will give you a good idea of what I'm talking about. And uh, from there, well, uh, if you, again, if you like what you see, it may invite you or stimulate you to follow the course. Again, we have to do the disclaimer that participants should be aware of the potential risk of using limited knowledge <clears throat> when incorporating new techniques in their practice. Again, this is not a course, this is a lecture. Uh, you shouldn't try anything from what you learn here. Um, and again, if I talk about a product or anything, I have no commercial ties whatsoever. So if I talk about a product, except when I'm talking about my course, which of course I'm paid for, um, if, you, if I talk about any product, I have no commercial ties. I'm not paid to talk about any product. So now, um, I, like this, I like this slide to open up. The eyes can't see what the brain doesn't know. So the goal of this presentation is to put in your minds what's going on within the temporomandibular joint uh, that can affect what's going on in the mouth and in orthodontic treatments especially. 40% uh, of my practice is post-ortho cases. So 40% of the patients I see are patients that have had ortho and are uncomfortable in their mouth. Um, and that comes typically from bite issues or joint issues or a combination of both. Um, I'm, I'm skipping a part of this lecture that I've already given in the first free intro. So I would encourage you before you watch this one to watch the first free intro which is who needs a splint and why, because in the, in the introduction there, you will see uh, an introduction to the joint and how to look at uh, a disc displacement and how to look at an MRI. And uh, that could sort of help you before watching this lecture, which sort of uh, put a little bit of information in your mind so that you can better profit from this lecture. Okay. So, I like, this, I like this little introduction because it shows the link between uh, the temporomandibular joint, the jaw, the occlusion, and the neck. Uh, there, there was two different studies came out, both in cranio, one in 2005 went by Detilio and, uh, and others, and the other one is 2015 by Ramirez and others. And both studies came to the same conclusion. They studied rats and they created a shift in the occlusion by creating an interference on a molar with a little bit of composite resin. And what happened to all the study rats is their necks became crooked and their full spine had full scoliosis after just a period of a few days, like seven days. Um, when they removed the interference or they balanced it by creating the same on the other side, they actually got the rats to become straight again, the, their, their spines to become straight again. So there's an incredible influence of jaw position and jaw function on the spine. And we suspect that it's through the pharyngeal constrictors that are attached both to the mandible and to the base of the skull and the cervical spine, the upper cervical spine. All right. Um, I want to talk two seconds about another study about cervical spine posture and twin block treatment. Uh, it's been shown in at least one study, uh, 2019, so a recent study, that uh, twin bulk treatment can actually help with the spine. So uh, uh, when you get growth stimulation and you're actually repositioning the mandible in a better position um, and you get growth and you get a better bite, you can actually uh, help with someone's spine. Uh, I would suspect that this is more true of growing children or adolescents than with adults, but uh, I will let those of you that do orthodontics do their research on that. I just found that interesting because it's, it's one of the secondary effects of what we all do. Okay, so uh, I'm going right away into the cases. So we have seven cases that, uh, that will show 
how degrading joints actually affect the bite. And they're all ortho cases, so pre or per or post ortho. So either patients came to us before ortho to get treatment to stabilize their joints before the ortho, or they came during the ortho because they were having problems during the ortho, or they came because of relapse post ortho and needed ortho treatment again. So the first case um, is uh, a young female. She's 14 years old. She was sent to me by the orthodontist because the orthodontist noted a change in her condyles from the age of nine to the age of 14. And uh, she had a palate expansion early on. Now, you can see on the 2017 panoramic image that she has two condyles. Like, yeah, which is, which is normal for a nine-year-old, right? Um, but then, well, this is, this is her, the, the picture of her teeth, her mouth. In 2017, she's edge to edge, so her maxillary hasn't grown very well. Uh, and then in 2022, the bites opened. And what went wrong? Well, is it the tongue? Is it just the tongue? <clears throat> or look at the panoramic image from January 2022. There are no more condyles left. Um, so she had severe osteoarthritis, well, uh, condylar resorption, uh, and both her joints are gone. Both her condyles are gone. And the MRI revealed bilateral anterior disc displacement bilateral non-reducing discs, and disc, de disc degeneration, marrow edema in whatever was left of the condyles, and of course, severe osteoarthritic damage of the joints. So if you look at the MRI, you will see here that you only have a neck of the condyle left. The, dick is, the disc is totally out here. The other condyle is totally flattened, totally sclerotic. Again, this is only the neck of the condyle. And then you have uh, the disc that's way out here. Um, so this child, probably at the age of nine or somewhere between the age of nine and 14, totally lost her discs. And then the condyle started to degrade and then her bite just got even worse. Um, and the orthodontist wanted me to stabilize what was left to be able to do orthodontics later on. Well, um, I would not do, I don't do orthodontics, but I would not suggest doing orthodontics on joints that are so bad until we've proven that they're either stable or until they've been reconstructed. Um, I would definitely not try and move anything around in her mouth uh, before the joints have stabilized because these types of joints have a tendency to change and degrade. And whatever you would do to the teeth would actually change quickly in time because the foundation is unstable and is changing. All right. Um, so first thing we did was make a good night guard for her. And she's only 14. And look at the thickness we had to make that night guard because of the severity of the opening of the bite and the overjet. Uh, so we didn't have a choice. It had to be that thick because we have to make a flat plane. We have to get the loading off the joints and hopefully she'll stabilize. Uh, we started this case not too long ago. That was October 2022. Um, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen yet, but we're following her. She's good. She's better. She's, she has less pain than she'd had. Uh, hasn't changed much in the past few months, but time will tell what's going to happen with her. I suspect, I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that she's going to be a double prosthesis patient someday. Hopefully as far out in her life as possible. Okay. Uh, this patient, only 17 years old, uh, had episodes of jaw lock, but recently had a closed jaw lock that was, that was limited and gave her a limited opening, and that was lasting. Um, she also had episodes of migraine, and she had left TMJ pain that irradiated to her neck. 
she had palatal expansion and, and first phase ortho between the age of 7 and 12. Um, she feels that she clenches and that her mandible is deviated to her left. Now, these are the pictures of her face. You can see she's retrognathic. Uh, you can see she's deep bite in the front. She, her midline, her lower midline is sli slightly deviated to her left. Crowding. And on the panoramic image, you can clearly see that the uh, right condyle is somewhat developed, but the left condyle is severely underdeveloped. So that's where all of that comes from. So the joint here is degrading. Now on the MRI, if you look at the, uh, this image, the right joint is relatively good. I mean, the condyle is pretty good, is in pretty good shape. The disc is out, but at least the condyle is resisting. It's there. But on the left joint, on the bottom image, you can definitely see there's only a neck of a condyle left. She's had severe condylar resorption. And she, again, this is active. So uh, doing more ortho on her now is not a great idea. This needs to be stabilized. And especially, I mean, this, this type of case, you would do ortho and surge on. Um, if you do orthodontics and surgery on a case where the condyles are in this type of state, uh, you're planning, you're, you're possibly planning trouble. Um, these are unstable joints. They change with time. The bite shifts, the mandible shifts. Patients become typically uncomfortable. They get headaches on the side that it's shifted to because the muscles aren't working in coordinated pair with the other side. They're overworking because the bite's harder on that side. And uh, this is just a situation where the patient definitely needs to be stabilized before going to any further treatment. Again, this is another patient that may someday end up with a total joint replacement or a rib graft or something that'll stop the process from evolving. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, on the right joint, as I said, anterior disc displacement with reduction, subgrowth, and some effusion in the joint. Left joint, disc displacement without reduction, severe subgrowth, marrow edema, and, uh, and some uh, effusion. Now, this case, a uh, 60-year-old woman, patient consulted in 2013 due to, due to TMJ crepitus, mostly on the left side that kept getting worse. She had limited opening, neck pain on her left side. She had braces from canine to canine, upper arch only, but that was years and years ago. So we did a night guard for her. We tried to stabilize her, but slowly with time, she kept degrading, even though we, we tried to treat her. Now, we have a, a pretty high success rate at stabilizing patients using the night guards we use. Like the night guards I show in the course have a very high success rate at stabilizing patients. But at least one to 2% of the patients we see end up in surgery because they don't stabilize. The body, for some reason, doesn't want to stabilize, even though we're putting in the effort. Um, so from 2013 to 2019, you can see that her bite opened. Uh, again, is this a tongue problem or is this a joint problem? Well, let's have a look. Mm. Well, looking at the panoramic image in 2014, you can already see that the condyles are very flattened out. There's no space between the condyle and the fossa on either side. And if you look at the MRI uh, from 2019, you can definitely see that the condyles are totally flat, the discs are out of place, they're non-reducing discs, and there's osteoarthritis going on in both joints. So this is the type of case where you can suspect that the joints just continued to degrade, even though we tried to treat her, they continued to degrade, and that created smaller condyles, retrusion of the mandible, and opening of the bite in the front. Now, as the mandible retrudes, the tongue is also lacking space more and more. So it can be a combination of both melting joints and tongue activity. All right. So she went through, uh, once, we, once we, she ended up stabilizing, because she, she did, in the end, stabilize, but then she went to orthodontic treatment again. 
and uh, orthodontics were not enough. And the surgeon said, well, I'd like to replace her joints. So he did a set of, um, uh, of prostheses that you can see right here. So even though we had somewhat stabilized the joints and he, she was better, she was still in a situation where the joints were iffy for the long term and the surgeon and the patient decided they wanted stability. They didn't want to go through this again. So they did the, to the total joint replacement for her. Um, okay. Now, this patient consulted us in 2019 for constant joint pain, cervical pain, and muscle tension. Uh, crepitus on the left side, daily headaches. She's a physician, by the way. Um, she had to avoid activities that caused pain, and even talking was hard for her. She, had, she was a physician, but she had to stop working for a while because she couldn't talk to her patients. So she had physiotherapy sessions and then heard a loud click in the left joint and started to deviate to the left and her teeth weren't touching like before. And then she got cortisone injections every month for her cervical hernia and just all sorts of things going on in her head, head and neck. Now, you can see she's very short in both rami. She's retrognathic. She has a strong overjet, strong class two, of course. Um, and this is the result of poor growing condyles or degrading condyles. Now, on the panoramic image, they don't look so bad. And that's something I've been talking about is that panoramic images, you all know, they're not the best images for the joint. But to what extent? Well, you can tell here. Um, See, even though the joints did look not too bad on the panoramic image, on the right joint on the MRI, you can see that the disc is totally out and there's no space between the condyle and the fossa. So that condyle, after the disc vacated, went back and up into the fossa, creating some of the retrusion of the mandible. On the left joint, it's worse. I mean, the disc is totally out and the condyle is severely osteoarthritic. And that's why she was having pain on the left side and she was hearing crepitus in that joint. If you look in the open mouth view, you can see that the condyle, the degrading condyle, is totally rubbing against the eminence. The eminence is flattening out and it's just habit going on in that, in that area. Um, so we had her on the splint for a couple of years. She eventually went for orthodontics and surgery. But this time the joint did stabilize with our treatment. She went for orthodontics uh, and, and surgery and eventually uh, got better. And this is pre-ortho and post-ortho. So she's a lot better now. She had, of course, advancement of the mandible. And we equilibrated her dentition after and now she's happy and she's comfortable and she's out of her jaw pain and she's out of her neck pain because things are back in position and functioning harmoniously like it's supposed to. Now, she's not lopsided anymore. Like people don't put enough importance on having an unequilibrated bite, having a bite shifted to one side. Can you imagine walking with one leg shorter than the other and or having a pebble in your shoe and having a not equilibrated walk, how that could potentially create tension in your legs and tension in your lower back and tension in your hips. Well, some people may resist minor differences and some people don't resist minor differences. And some people have major differences in the good and some people have major differences and they have problems. Now, uh, I always, I often hear the argument that, yeah, but we have an adaptation system. Yes, we do. We do, and luckily we do, because or else I'd be treating patients all the time, day in, day out, night and day. Um, we have a capability of adapting, but we don't have the same capability all our life, and not all of us have the same capability. I mean, when we're tired, we, we don't endure things like when we're rested. Um, so our, when we're stressed out, our resistance diminishes. Our 
mental resistance, our emotional resistance, and our physical resistance. So one of the reasons a lot of these patients come to us when they're in stress periods and their stress levels are very high is that their resistance is lower. They have the same aggression factors or they are, they're even, they have more aggression factors because they're clenching even more because they're stressed out and their resistance is lowered. So then they come to us in pain and in tension and then they have all sorts of, all sorts of symptoms. And we try and get their bites straight and we work on our part and we have them work on their stress. And hopefully together we're going to do something that's going to get them out of their present situation and get them into a better situation, a better set of uh, conditions that are going to be conducive for them to health, for the health and comfort for the long term. All right. Uh, this case, she was sent to me by the orthodontist during the orthodontic treatment. So she was nine months in her ortho treatment and started having left TMJ pain. Now, if we uh, look at the bite, I mean, the bite looks okay. I mean, this is, the treatment is almost, is almost finished, almost terminated, uh, but not quite. And looking at the panoramic image, the joints look not too bad. Again, the panoramic, Im panoramic image is not the best image. So this is pre-ortho, and the left joint looks actually pretty good. It actually looks better than the right one. But when we look at the MRI, it's the opposite. So the right joint is deformed. The disc is out. There's a nasty fight. Um, on the open mouth view, you have the condyle rubbing against the eminence in a convex to convex situation. And this is not great. You typically don't want that type of situation because that's a lot of pressure on a small condyle, uh, a lot of pressure on a very small surface. And that typically can lead to degradation. But luckily for her, her right joint is, is resisting. But if you go down to the left side, well, you can see there's no cortical layer at all left on the condyle and it is actively degrading. So again, it's eminence against condyle, but this one did not resist and the condyle just caved in. The cortical layer melted away and she started having pain and crepitus and everything we've talked about. And her jaw started to shift to that side as well. So we're in the process of stabilizing her. We're treating her right now. Um, she has stabilized on her night guard. She is not changing, so the jaw isn't shifting anymore. Uh, it stopped after three or four months of treatment. Uh, she's out of her pain, so she's doing good. And we, we're going to re-image her before she goes back to the orthodontist to finish the treatment. Now, hopefully, if she's stable, uh, she'll be stable. If she, hopefully, that she'll stabilize. We'll be able to see on the MRI that she has stabilized. And once we're sure she's stable, then uh, we can send her back to the orthodontist. And we're going to wait at least a period of six months of stability before she goes back. And we'll monitor her from then, from there. And after, after the orthodontist is finished. Uh, definitely we'll, we'll equilibrate her bite and we'll make her another night guard fully equilibrated to reduce the level of tension on the, off the joint. We definitely want that joint to be loaded as least as possible. Okay. Um, we spoke about that. Okay. Now, another case. Uh, this is a, this is a, an interesting case. Uh, this lady, 40 years old, uh, came to us after she saw her bite shifting. Now, she had full orthodontic treatment from ages 13 to 15 uh, and was okay. She had a stable bite and everything was okay for a good number of years. And at Christmas 2014, she took a selfie with a magnifying glass at her mother's place. And who does that? That's a little bit crazy. Um, but she, 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 for some reason, she did that and lucky she did. Because um, in March of 2015, this was her bite. Now, how, how could I have believed her teeth were closed three months before when she walks in in March of 2015 and has such an open bite and a shifted bite? And so that's the occlusion. Now, two years down the line, March 2017, she had shifted even more. 
Uh, in the intermediate period, we made a night guard for her. She kept progressing. She kept shifting, uh, even with the night guard. But at one point, after a few months, it started to stabilize. And two years down the line, it had stabilized. So if you look at the progression, we have December 2014, where the bites closed from the previous orthodontic treatment. Then things started to shift. Oh, the bites started opening. And you see October 2015 and February 2016 and then January 2017. So uh, you can see the, the severe progression there. Now, where did that come from? Well, look at the left condyle here. It's totally osteoarthritic. And on the MRI, this condyle is super small and the disc is totally out of place. So what happened? Now, were these conditions there when she finished the treatment 30 years ago? Or did this happen later? I mean, no one knows. No one knows. So th that's a point I stress. What's going on in the joint uh, is affected by all sorts of things. But the more the disc is displaced when you're young, the more chances of having it displaced even more, and having degeneration, there are. So when a patient walks in needing orthodontics when they're young, uh, again, we saw in the other lecture um, that it was demonstrated by and published in the, uh, uh, the Angle Orthodontist 20 years ago that adolescents, on average, pre-orthodontic have disc displacements. And we saw the percentages. In boys ages 13 to 15, 60% of their joints have displaced discs. And in girls, it's incredible, it's 75% of their joints that have displaced discs. So if a young girl, 13 to 15, walks into the office and requires orthodontics and the work is done, you have a three out of four chance of knowing that her discs are somewhat displaced and that this, with time, can get worse. Will it get worse? Not necessarily, we all know that. But there's a chance that it will get worse. And I'm in the wrong chair for this, but I only see patients that it got worse. So of course my view is biased, but I see a lot of them. And again, I see 850 patients a year, 40% of which are post-ortho cases, that are not good in their mouth. Um, so, and, and it's all because of joint problems and joint changes. All right. So anyways, at some point down the line, her disc got displaced even more and she shifted and then she's back to square one. So orthodontics again, she didn't require surgery. I don't have the, the, the finished photos here, but she did go to the orthodontist and using aligners, the orthodontist got the bite back into place and she's been stable now for about three years, uh, which is great news, by the way. Now, one last case. Um, this is a young woman, uh, works in a dental office. Uh, she was 30 at the time. This is a while ago. Um, had crooked teeth. <clears throat> said to herself, well, if I'm going to be working in a dental office. I might as well get my teeth straightened and went to the orthodontist and she said, you're a great ortho surge case. So we're going to do you. So great orthodontist. I know the orthodontist, great surgeon, um, fantastic people. They did their job perfectly well, aligned the teeth, advanced the mixel, advanced the mandible, got her airway cleared. And so this is the post-op in July of 2014. So if you look at the center bottom image, you will see that her teeth are perfectly coupled. Everything is good. Everything looks nice. The job, job is relatively well done, excellently done. Um, but three months later, the bites totally shifted. Uh, she's open on her right side and she's touching only on the last molars on the left. She has only contact all the way back here. No other contact in her mouth. So what happened? Well, uh, the orthodontist and the surgeon didn't understand what went on, so they sent her to me. Um, 
This was the panoramic image that was taken prior to the ortho. Uh, condyles are deformed or flattened. The, the space between the condyles and the, condyles and the eminence isn't great. Um, and here's the MRI. So all we did was prescribe an MRI and you can see that there is no condyle left on either left or right joint. So even though there was condyle left on the panoramic image pre-op, uh, three months post-op, there is absolutely nothing left. So um, in what type of state were these condyles before the surgery? Uh, we don't know. We don't have a CBCT scan to, to know that. We don't have an MRI just pre-op to know that. All we know is that three months post-op, everything is completely gone. She has had severe condylar resorption. And this, of course, uh, was a bilateral prosthesis case. I mean, there was nothing else to do for this patient. So uh, when I did the MRI and I told the surgeon, listen, she has no condyles left, uh, he said, okay, just send her back to me. I'll take care of her. And he did the prostheses on both sides. And this was done <clears throat> something like four or five years ago. She's doing good. She's happy. Uh, she has good opening. She's functioning well. So things ended up pretty good, but it took a lot of work to get there. And these, these are cases uh, that may seem to be alarming, but they're cases I see every day in my practice. And again, this is the short and sweet version of a 40-case uh, lecture. And I get cases like this every week. I can do a 40 case, a new 40 case lecture every couple of months um, because I just get a plethora of these cases. Um, there are other people out there talking about this too. I'm not the only one. Uh, I would definitely urge you to seek them out and to see who, who's talking about this because the people that are really into understanding how the bites get, how they are, uh, understand what's going on in the joint, and they understand joint pathology and joint degradation. And um, for the past few years, we've been hear hearing of orthodontic programs where they're now talking about joint pathology and the influence of the joint on the bite and on orthodontic treatment. So uh, definitely I would urge all people doing orthodontics to get good education in joint pathology and understand what's going on. Uh, and even though most cases do go well, when you have a discussion with your patient beforehand and they understand that when they walk into your office, they're not walking in with just crooked teeth. They're potentially walking in with poor joints and poor structures. And when you work on the teeth, you're not necessarily working on those structures. And if those structures go bad and degrade, it's not necessarily your fault. The problem was there before. So they have to know that they're at risk beforehand. Because I have to deal with patients that come to me and they find out their joint is degrading and has been degrading for a while. And a lot of them ask me, well, why didn't the orthodontist know this? Well... It's not necessarily in their curriculum, and it's not necessarily their job to know it. Uh, but that, that's what I say, but it's not necessarily what I think. I mean, I think orthodontists should be aware of what's going on in the joints because it affects their treatment. Uh, again, most treatments do go well, and most treatments are not so much of a problem, luckily. Um, but again... Uh, when you suspect a problem, discussing with the patient beforehand is always a lot better than having a problem with the patient after. All right. Now, uh, this article I talked about in the first lecture, I'm going over it quickly again. This is an article published in Scientific American by an anthropologist. This is the best article I've ever seen that explains what's been going on with her jaws and why do we have so much crook, so many crooked teeth today and so much poor growth of our maxillas. From an anthropological point of view, um, the, the Peter Unger states that uh, this jaw growth problem started about 250 years ago and has been progressing si since. And uh, if you have a few minutes, it's just a 10, 15 minute read. It's super interesting. And if you read that, you will understand a bit more about why I have so much work to do and maybe why you have so much work to do. Now, 
uh, every case that comes to me pre, post, or during ortho, uh, eventually when they go back to ortho, go back with a with a with an information that says, and the ortho is advised of the of this, that even though we may have stabilized the joints, um, or the joints may have stabilized, I should say, that they can always start degenerating again. Um, once joints are fragile, fragilized, they're fragile for life. So you should always be careful of traction, uh, of protrusion of the mandible when the discs are out of place. Uh, see, these, do these joint degradations are not always predictable and certainly out of our control. So even though patients are sent to us for stabilization and it works in a high, high number of patients, um, orthodontists or people doing orthodontics are always told that this may be stable forever and may not be. So be aware of what's going on. Um, so the best bite afterwards, again, we discussed this in the first intro lecture and we, we discussed this uh, a lot in the course, uh, giving them a seated condyle, seated canine bite with a canine guidance. That has been demonstrated for the past decade to be the bite that yields the least amount of stress on the whole system, including the joints. So that's the goal we have. That's the goal we're going for. Uh, we try to always see the patients after they've been through the orthodontics to uh, see if they require bite equilibration or another night guard to make sure that the joints are not overloaded uh, uh, as least as possible, at least at nighttime and daytime. Okay, um, when we do night guards, we have statistics of how we, how we succeed. So um, uh, the goal of a night guard, the goal of the night guard is to create an occlusal pattern where muscles work in coordinated pairs and the forces are as perfectly distributed as we can get them. So that's what we do with a night guard. There's nothing magical. It's a force distribution thing. Um, and muscles work in coordinated pairs like they're supposed to. So it distributes the load. Um, so doing that, muscles have a tendency to calm down and the joint has a tendency to be less loaded. So 95% of our patients experience a decrease in their headaches. And I look at the statistics. So they're pretty good. So 50% get about almost totally out of their headaches. 33% have a good reduction. 14% have a small reduction. And about 5% we have no effect on. Uh, it's about the same with the other things, with muscle pain and TMJ pain and neck pain. So getting the patient to function properly is, is good um, and creates relief in, in a lot of cases. Now, it's not a panacea. It's not a magical thing. Um, and again, a night guard is a force distribution appliance. And, it just, and, and it's a muscle coordination appliance. And it just gets the system into a, um, a design or a pattern that is more conducive to health than what was there before. So, uh, I would like you to listen to this. Uh, it's, it's a fun little finale. It's, it takes a, it's about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So listen to this. And you can watch the image at the same time, of course. That is Ok, arrêtez une seconde, serrez, puis recommencez. All right, so uh, thank you for watching. Hope you appreciated that. If I, if I was good enough at stimulating you and you enjoyed what you just saw and you found it interesting and the first intro course too, well, join us for a great adventure and uh, hope to see you in the course. <laughs>